So I know I've said it every week, but I really do think we're going to be a little bit shorter tonight um, because I cut off some of what I was planning on talking about just because I didn't want to rush through it. Um, and what we're going to be moving through tonight is a lot of repetition of what we looked at in the Old Testament, um, but it's really important that we spend time defining and walking through the definition and letting these passages we're going to look at define repentance for us. Um, because we're going to be kind of building repentance into our understanding of salvation tonight a little bit and the purpose of repentance and what it, what it accomplishes. And so it's really key that we get our definition correct before we start trying to understand how it plugs into our understanding of salvation. Um, so it probably will be a little bit repetition from where we were in the Old Testament, but we're just going to walk through and see how the New Testament really continues on those same ideas of repentance. So last week, just in way of review, we went over um, five words, but remember it was really just two words. These two are grouped together, um, metanoia and metanoeo basically the same word, just one's a verb, one's a noun. And then these three all kind of go together. Um, they basically mean to turn. Um, they all are built off of strepho. And then you just attach a preposition either uh, on, on the front of it, and it can either be turning towards epistrepho or turning away from apostrepho. So those were the words. Um, and and these, these first two are the, really the most significant. We talk about how um, even by the definition of the word, even just how it's constructed, it has mind in the word. It's, it's literally after understanding with your mind or subsequent knowledge with your mind. It, it's literally, if you break it apart, it's, it's after mind or with mind. Um, and so the New Testament is really honing in on this idea of repentance being a change of mind. And so we walked through last week about how it can be a change of mind about sin or a chain of mind about God, and that moves us into where we're going to be tonight. We've, we've emphasized, as we've been walking through this, um, the internal aspect of repentance. Right? We, we spent a lot of time in the Old Testament talking about repentance is, is the inward change of the heart, turning of the heart um, from sin to God. Um, but we, we've spent a lot of time talking about the inward transformation. Um, but I don't want us to lose sight, especially as we move into the New Testament, of how much repentance changes your external actions. Uh, and that's so clear in the New Testament. It's, it's really, every time this word's talked about, yes, it's an inward change, but it, it's always going to change your actions. You cannot have repentance, true repentance, without it changing your action. Um, so if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 3. We aren't going to turn to a whole bunch of places tonight, but I wanted us to kind of place this first verse in its context um, before we get too far into it. Um, Matthew chapter 3, this is when the Pharisees are coming out to John the Baptist's baptism on the Jordan River. Um so picking up, well, let, let's start, uh, I'll read verse 2, and then we'll pick up in verse 7. Um, so, well, I'll start in verse 1. In those days, John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So he's, he's calling the people to repentance. Um, and then, sorry, I'll switch slides on you. He's calling the people to repentance. And then if you hop down to verse number uh, 7, it says, But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warns you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down, and thrown into the fire. So John the Baptist, in calling people to repentance, calls specifically the Pharisees and the Sadducees to bear fruit in keeping with their repentance, right? So, so John the Baptist is 
is pointing to their fruit as an evidence of their repentance. And he's saying, you know, don't think you've repented if you aren't bearing fruit that's keeping with your repentance. There's, there's this idea, this implication that repentance is always going to lead to this bearing of fruit. It's just understood um, to the point where John the Baptist can say, okay, if you aren't bearing fruit, that's inconsistent with repentance. You haven't really repented. If you have repented, well, then the consistent thing would be for you to be bearing fruit that evidences that. Bear fruit um, keeping with your repentance. Bear fruit that evidences the repentance that's gone on inside of you. Um, And so he calls the Pharisees and the Sadducees to do this. And the consequence of not bearing that fruit is explained in verse 10. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. It's not that, okay, you haven't produced, you haven't worked, you haven't performed enough works to earn your way to heaven. It's that if you don't have good fruit, it means that you've never repented in the first place. Uh, Therefore, you're going to be cast out. Um, you've You've never had faith. You've never had repentance. Um, if you've never had fruit. So if you don't have this fruit, it points to the fact that you do not have repentance um, and you will not have eternal life. You'll be cut down and thrown into the fire. So, so John is making this very clear that fruit is essential to repentance, right? So internal change, yes, but fruit is always going to come with it. Um, we've got some other passages. Um, we looked at this one last week, Acts 8.22. This is Peter talking to Simon the magician. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours. So change your mind about the sin, and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. Similar thing in Acts 26.19. Y'all remember the, um, the context of this passage, who's speaking, who he's talking to? Yeah, so Paul, exactly, yeah, Paul's before Agrippa, he's, he's given his testimony is how we would say, but he's just recounting the Damascus Road, what happened, where God, where Jesus commissioned him to go, um, and so he's, he's conveying this to Agrippa, he says, Therefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, and throughout all the region of Judea, and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God performing deeds and keeping with their repentance. So again, we see this, this, this idea of continuing on and performing deeds that are evidence and support the fact that you have repented, right? So, and, and, and too with that is this idea where you, you have repentance, you turn to God, you turn away from sin, repent towards God, um, and then you enter into a lifestyle of performing deeds in keeping with their repentance, with your repentance, right? So it doesn't end. Like, it's not as if you just repent one time and you check that off your list. It's a call to a continual bearing fruit that, that, that keeps with your repentance. Um, and then finally, we really don't have time to walk through these, but um, I think four of the seven churches are called to repentance in Revelation 2 through 3. Um, in each one of those, there's a specific sin or a specific area where they've neglected um, something that they should be attending to um, that, has, that they are called to repent of. And so you get the idea that there's specific sins, um, specific instances of failure that they're called to repent from. Um, so all throughout the New Testament, like repentance is internal, and we're about to walk through that, but just don't lose sight of the fact that it really always does impact your actions. Um, I always think of um, Paul Washer, he gives the illustration of like if, if you encountered a guy that came in here and said, man, you won't believe I just got hit by a semi-truck. And you say, no, you don't, you, you didn't. Like, you're fine. If you got hit by a semi-truck, I'd be able to tell. Like, there would, you, you wouldn't be the same. You wouldn't be walking up in here like nothing happened. And so it is when you're hit with when you repent, like you don't just repent and you aren't changed. Your, your life is going to change as a result of repentance that occurs in your mind and in your heart. Um, 
that being said, the New Testament doesn't lose um, the idea of repentance being an internal shift. Um, and it, it still emphasizes the relational shift and the shift of your affections, right? So we've talked about this from the beginning. Repentance is a change of action. It's a change of mind. And it's also got this, this element of like change of emotion or affection, however you want to word that. Um, but it changes what your, your, your affections are drawn to. So your affections are set on sin and worldliness, and then they're radically shifted and converted to being set on God and His Word and his, keeping His law, walking in obedience. Um, this first verse I have up here, um, Luke 1.16, this is um, the angel prophesying the ministry of John the Baptist and saying that John the Baptist will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. That, that word there, um, whoops, that word there, turn, is our word that we've talked about, um, strepho, turning to God, um, and really carries this, the idea that we looked at in the Old Testament where we talked at length about turning to God with all of your heart. Um, very, very same language there. Um, Romans 6, 17, um, But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. So you get the idea that this isn't just an obedience that we stir up in ourselves. It's not just an obedience that's... It's an obedience that's rooted in an internal change. Um, and what Paul's expressing here is it's an obedience that's rooted... It's coming from the heart. Um, so again, you just get this idea of a foundational internal change that leads to these external changes and always leads to the external changes. You, can't, you just really can't separate those ideas. Um, James 4. Uh, this probably is one of the examples where I, I would say uh, you really get a glimpse of the New Testament building on Old Testament language of repentance. Um, I think it's Zechariah 7 uh, says, um, turn to the Lord and He will turn to you or return to the Lord and He will return to you. Um, and he, you see, I really think that James is more or less paraphrasing that. He says, draw near to God and He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and He will exalt you. So, again, you get this idea that we should never have this cavalier attitude towards sin or be casual with it. Um, just like in the Old Testament, we saw people being broken over their sin and weeping over their sin and, and fasting and all those sort of things. The New Testament doesn't have quite as many examples of that, but it's, it's still here. And that still should be our attitude over sin. We aren't nearly broken enough over our sin. Um, and we would do well to pray that God would work these sort of things that we see in James into our lives. Um, and that our affections would continually be drawn away from sin and continually be broken over the sin in our lives. Um, and that we would be moved to being wretched and mourning and weeping over those things. Um, so again, you just you see those things present in the New Testament. Um, a lot of those same ideas that we saw in the Old Testament. Oh, and then Revelation two, um, verse four says, "But I have this against you that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you." and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet this you have, you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Right, so this, this passage, um, Christ is warning the churches, um, and uh, he, he, he warns the church at Ephesus about how they have fallen away from their first love. Right, so they started out, correctly, apparently. They, they started out with their affections in the right place. They apparently had turned to God, um, but at some point along the way, they had lost their first love. Their, their affections had waned, right? They had, for one reason or another, they had quit loving Christ as they ought to. Um, and we aren't really 
told why or how that played out, but they lost the love that they had at first. What's interesting, though, in verse 5, when he calls them to repent, he calls them to do the works that they did at first. So you get this idea that they, they started with love for Christ. That was good. And they were also doing works that were good, that reflected that love. And then their love for Christ waned, and they're called to repent and return to that, and also return to the works that they had done at first. So again, you just get the idea of the connection between the internal shift, like the heart behind repentance, heart turning towards God, a heart that even is set on loving God and loving um, the law of God um, and obeying the law of God. You, you, those two go hand in hand, right? So, so the picture of repentance there is, is returning to your affection that you had and returning to the works that you had as well as a result of that affection that you had. Um, so all those things whoops, are really just a continuation of all the things that we saw in the Old Testament as far as the relational shift and the, the effectual shift that comes through repentance. And then, of course, we've talked about how repentance is the shift of the mind. And really every instance of metanoeo or metanoia um, by just the, the, the construction of the word itself implies a change of mind. That's what it is. And so I didn't list all those examples for us because we've already walked through a bunch of them. But I wanted to throw a couple examples up here of instances where believers are called um, or described as those who are changing their mind or setting their mind on other things as a result of the conversion that comes through the Holy Spirit, but the language of repentance is never there. So you get the idea. It's the same idea, same description of conversion, same change of mind going on. It's just being described with different language. Um, in fact, Paul very rarely uses um, the language of repentance that we've looked at. He, he instead, a lot of times, uses the language of Romans 8 that we're going to look at right here. It says, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. So language there is you've got um, setting mindset on the flesh versus mindset of the spirit. Um, and so that's just the language that Paul uses to describe the conversion process, conversion from mind being set on flesh to mind being set on the spirit. Um, and so you flesh that out. He's got, you've got two different mindsets going on, one set on the flesh, one set on the spirit, which leads to how they live who live according to the flesh. So you're either going to live according to what your mind is set on, the flesh, or you're going to live according to the Spirit. Um, so you're going to live according to the Spirit. And the end result is if you set your mind on the flesh, it leads to death. Set the mind on the Spirit leads to life and peace. Right? So... Two different mindsets, two different ways of living as a result of that mindset, two different outcomes. Um, and so it, it very much shows a description of the conversion process of going from death to life and peace through the Spirit. And all that is um, evidenced and fleshed out through what your mind is set on. Is it set on things of the flesh? or set on things of the Spirit. So that's just the language that Paul talks about, but you can, you can clearly see that he's dealing with the mind as central um, to that. Uh, similar, Romans 12, 2, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your, what? Of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So again, it's, it's the mind is the thing that's being renewed. Um, Colossians 3.2, set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. So again, it, it, it deals with the, the mind. Um, so this whole idea of repentance, um, 
like I said, I started out with talking about how it, it deals with your actions. It always leads to a change of your actions, but it always starts with a change of mind. Um, so that's, that's so central to the New Testament idea of repentance. It's a change of mind. Um, so those are the dimensions of repentance, um, and a lot of those, I hope, are, are ringing bells to um, what we talked about when we moved through the Old Testament. It's really just a continuation. I know a lot of that's a repetition of what we've already been looking at, um, but it, it's helpful as we're defining repentance and understanding what it is that we take the time to see those New Testament passages and, and see how repentance is described through them. Um, but finally, we get to the purpose of repentance or what repentance accomplishes. Um, so Mark 1, 4, John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, Luke 24, 47. And that repentance... Um, this is when Jesus is commissioning his disciples to go and uh, before he ascends. It says, And that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. So what does repentance accomplish in those two passages? Forgiveness, right. And so Old Testament, we saw glimpses of that, but really the, the Old Testament picture was um, salvation from God's judgment, and that, that the picture of it, how that fleshed itself out, was usually salvation from God expelling them from the land, right? It, especially once you get into the prophets. If the people were to repent, God would relent from the disaster of sending them into exile. So you still get the picture of, of um, repenting being a means or how they would escape God's judgment, right? Um, but it was more in physical terms in the Old Testament, right? It was, it was about being exiled from the land. Um, that was what they would be saved from. In the New Testament, it becomes a, what it works is forgiveness of sins. We see that in both those passages, um, a couple more passages where we see that, Acts 3.19. This is Peter uh, speaking. He says, Repent, therefore, and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out. Um, and then again, this is Paul before Agrippa. Um, it says, uh, this is when Jesus, he's recounting what Jesus told him to, to go and to speak to the Gentiles, um, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light, and uh, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So again, you get the picture of repentance, working forgiveness of sins, right? And that's why it's so important. We've spent so much time defining repentance and understanding the internal aspects of repentance. Because if we define repentance as just a human work in stopping sin, and that's all it is, is just like me stopping my sin. And that's, that's all the picture we have of repentance. And we haven't walked through and seen the whole biblical picture. Then these, these passages would present a problem for us, right? Because that, then it would look like, okay, we, we stop doing our sins based on our human ability. And that grants us forgiveness of sin. But that's not the biblical picture of repentance at all. And so that's why it's so critical we've spent so much time walking through defining repentance and defining the internal shift, turning your heart to God, changing your mind about the things of God and that, that resulting in faith towards God and hatred for sin, all those sort of things so that we don't end up with a works-based idea of repentance or salvation, right? Yes, it always is going to result in our actions being changed, um, but the biblical picture of repentance is so much more than just you you, you working on your own strength to change your own actions for your own salvation. That's not the picture of it. It's always a change of action, but it always starts, um, starts internally. And as we're going to look at it in a second, it always starts um, by work of God. It's not your own work that does it. You don't accomplish it in yourself. Um, here's another passage um, from Luke 13. It says... 
there were some present at that very time who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with the, their sacrifices. And he answered them, this is Jesus speaking, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. So what does repentance accomplish in that passage? Yeah, it saves you from perishing, right? And so you get the idea that what's going on here is these people are saying, well, I must not be that bad because, you know, I, I'm looking down my nose at these people who were killed in an unnatural way, either something going on with Pilate um, he, he had them killed or they were killed by some freak accident with this tower falling on them. But listen, I'm doing good. God's blessed me. I'm experiencing his blessings. I haven't been killed in this way. Therefore, things must be going good for me. I must be in a good relationship with God. Everything must be fine. And Jesus says, no, don't, don't think that your present blessing or present experience of God's grace in your life means that you're, you're good, you're good to go, right? He says, unless you repent, you're going to perish too. Your time's coming. It reminded me of the attitude that Job's friends have when, when they encounter Job. They're like, Job, all these things are happening to you. You must have sinned. What'd you do? Um, and their mindset is like, okay, if I'm not experiencing all these kind of things that Job's experiencing, if my family's not being killed off, and all these sorts of awful things, that must mean that I'm good to go, I'm righteous, um, God and I are, are in good fellowship with one another. And Jesus is like, absolutely not. Don't fool yourself into thinking that just because you're experiencing some grace right now, that things are fine. No, you have to repent. That's, that's what it boils down to. Um, and so, I mean, that's something for us to keep in mind, too, because we're so blessed, and we walk, and I mean, God's been so gracious to us in so many ways that we could all testify, and if we aren't careful, sometimes we get going in patterns of life where things are going really, really well, and we think that we, we just get complacent in our relationship with God. We get complacent in our repentance, um, and we fail to stop and pray and examine ourselves and see where we fall are continuing to fall short um, and so repentance in this passage um, saves them from perishing and I would say in an ultimate sense I think Christ is getting at final perishing um, eternal perishing and so repentance is necessary for salvation. And then finally, um, I had one other slide on there, I thought. Oh, never mind. Source of repentance. So, as we've been walking through this, um, we've talked a lot, and, and I want to st st state at the start that um, repentance as we're going to walk through these passages and see, is always a gift of God's grace, but that in no way um, diminishes human responsibility to repent. God calls all men everywhere to repent, and we will all be held responsible for whether or not we obey that call to repent. Um, but the reality is it's much like faith in that we can't produce faith in ourselves. Faith is always a gift that comes from outside of us. Um, and so repentance is very much so in line with that thought as we're moving through these passages. I hope, I hope we see that. Acts 5.31, um, God exalted him, Christ, at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. So Christ 
is the one who grants repentance for the purpose of forgiveness of sins. And who does he grant that to? In that passage. The Israel. Right. Um, but the author of Acts, Luke, he, he, he goes on a couple chapters later and says, When they heard these things, they fell silent and they glorified God, saying, Then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. Right? So same idea. God is the one granting repentance. The outcome of that repentance is life. And who in this verse, uh, who are the recipients of repentance? The Gentiles. Yeah. So Luke's showing us in the way he's presenting this idea that it's comprehensive. And Paul also gives us a picture of this in 2 Timothy 2.24. He, he's giving instruction and a description of the Lord's servant. He says, And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. And they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. So a couple of things that are really cool in that passage um, talking about repentance, right, leading to a knowledge of the truth. So again, you get the idea that repentance is tied to your understanding and your knowledge and, and, and your mind, right? Um, they may come to their senses, um, same idea. Uh, and that reminds me of um, the prodigal son when he comes to his senses and he repented and returned to his father, right? So very much of this idea of repentance is is coming to right knowledge of the truth and coming to your senses. Other interesting thing is that these these false teachers um, or these these opponents of the Lord's servant that Paul's describing here, he describes them as those who are doing the will of the devil, right? So they're blinded. They don't have true knowledge of the truth. their, Their senses are diminished. And as a result, they're doing the will of the devil. And so you get the idea, the flip side of this would be if they repent, um, they get the true knowledge of the truth, right? They come to knowledge of the truth. They come to their senses. And as a result, they will no longer be ensnared by the devil. And they will no longer be doing his will. Instead, what would they be doing? They'd be doing the will of God. Um, it's not explicit there, but I think it's, it's safe to say that's the implication. And that's, I mean, every time you see repentance, it's always going to be fleshed out in your actions. Um, but again, this is all based on God granting them repentance. So you get the idea that it's, it's Israel, if they repent, it's based on God being gracious and granting repentance. If the Gentiles repent, it's based on God being gracious and granting repentance. And even opponents in the church, um, if they repent, it will be because God grants them repentance, right? So that's the picture we get of repentance. It's always a gift of God to everybody. It's all-encompassing. If you experience repentance, it's by God's grace. Again, we see it, um, Paul, 2 Corinthians 3.12 Since we have such a hope, we are very bold, not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. But their minds were hardened. Interesting there, the minds are hardened. For to this day, when they read the old covenant, that same veil remains unlifted, because only through Christ is it taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So again, you get this idea of, 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 of minds being hardened and of a veil that remains unlifted, and 
um, a veil over the heart, right? So people without God, without Christ, bringing true vision, true clarity, and softening the mind and removing the veil of the heart, they're left in a state of not being able to understand the gospel. They're left in a state of not being able to love the gospel or have their hearts turned to the gospel. And so the only remedy for this is turning to the Lord. And Paul concludes this passage by reminding us, for all this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit, right? So again, it, any, any kind of clarity, any kind of understanding that we've been able to grasp of the gospel and of the things that we love and hold to be true and salvific for us, the only thing that we have to thank um, for understanding those things um, are, is God opening our eyes and removing the veil over our hearts so that we can comprehend and understand and trust those things. So, again, the source of repentance is God. And then finally, we looked at this passage. This is the last passage we'll look at tonight. Um, we looked at this one last week. Super interesting passage um, from 2 Corinthians 7, 9. It says, As it is, I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. For you felt a godly grief, so that you suffered no loss through us. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. It was interesting. I was reading through um, some stuff as I was preparing this week, and it was just talking about how repentance um, between the Old Testament and the New Testament had become a kind of a philosophical idea or, or something that, like, I guess philosophers promoted as an ethical way of life um, and as, as uh, a means to a, a more fulfilled, I guess, lifestyle. And so they said, look, like these vices aren't very fulfilling. Why don't you pursue this life of virtue and repentance instead as a means of bettering your life? Uh, more or less. And so it's interesting, you know, I don't know that that's exactly what Paul's getting at with this worldly grief, but people will stop sinning for various reasons, right, that don't have anything to do with God. I mean, even secular people will stop certain sins because they just don't like the effects of it, and they want to better their life. And they understand, like, hey, these things actually cause damage. And so... God's general grace brings at least enough knowledge for many people who are completely secular and opposed to God to realize the defilement and corruption that comes from some sin. And I can't help but think that's what Paul's getting at here, is there's a worldly type of grief over sin that causes you to regret or be discomforted or not like certain sin, but it's totally unrelated to God, and it accomplishes nothing but death because at the end of the day, all it drives you to do is rely on your own work to make your own life better and really has nothing to do about you depending on God to work repentance in you. So it's totally a workspace type repentance or sorrow or grief. It's totally worldly. The flip side, and while we're talking about this verse tonight, is that um, this godly grief in the Greek, it's literally um, the down from God grief. It's kata, which is a, a, pro, uh, not a, pronoun, a pre, uh, preposition, uh, which means down, down from or from, and then um, theon, theon, God. And so it's down from God grief. And so I don't really like the way that's translated here because it just seems like it's, it's describing, well, this is a godly kind of grief, but in the Greek, if you look at it, it's, it's really describing it as a source of your grief. No, God is, the, God is the source and the giver of this type of grief. It comes down from Him. Um, and so, again, the only type of grief that moves us to genuine repentance comes from God. So, so God enacts repentance in, in Israel. God enacts repentance in Gentiles. God enacts repentance in opponents in the church. Everybody who receives repentance receives it from God. Um, God 
even is the source of the type of grief that leads us to genuine repentance out of brokenness of our sin. Um, so all that, that idea of God being the source of our repentance, I know this is stuff that we've, we talk about a lot, especially in terms of our faith coming from God and not coming from ourselves. So it's, it's not a lot of new information, but this should be stuff that constantly moves us to worship God in such a deep way because without God intervening in our life, we would be left with the heart described in Jeremiah 17 that was deceitful and incurably sick, if you translate that word. It's incurably sick. It'd be absolutely hopeless without God. And in fact, we would chase every kind of defilement and every kind of sin and we would, we would be tricked and fooled and we would be blinded into believing that every sin would satisfy us and would be in a, a hopeless pattern of chasing after sin, hoping that it would bring some kind of satisfaction. And that's where we would be without God. And so we have so much to be thankful for that God has given us the gift of repentance. He has removed the veil over our hearts. He's softened our minds. He's turned our hearts towards Him so that we can comprehend and understand the gospel, change our minds and depend fully on Him, and move to a hatred and a godly grief over sin so that we don't chase those defilements, but we are moved into continually producing fruit that keeps with repentance. So we have nothing to thank but Christ for our repentance. Um, this should also move us to cry out to God for more and more repentance, right? If we, if we want, I mean, if I want more water, I've got to go to the faucet, right? You've got to go to the source if you want more repentance. And so I pray that as we've been moving through these things, if nothing else, it's going to change your prayer life into crying out to God, please, God, break me over my sin. Please, God, work repentance into my life. I don't hate my sin nearly enough. I don't love your law nearly enough. Please work more repentance into me. Help me to grow in repentance. Um, so I pray that that would be our prayer as we recognize that this comes from God. We have to cry out to God for repentance. Um, and again, it, it doesn't neg negate one bit our responsibility to repent. It's a tension, but it's what's in the text. We're called to repent. All men everywhere are called to repent. And yet God is the one that provides repentance. He is the source of repentance. Um, so we just have to cry out um, and depend fully on Him to provide repentance. And then finally, if, if, we are, if we're, the veil has been removed, if the Spirit's revealed um, the truth of Scripture, if our minds have been softened, if we have been given this godly kind of grief over sin and a brokenness for it, don't dare soften that and suppress that and try to push that away and not repent. We're so prone, even when we pray for these things and even when we pray for repentance, as soon as the Holy Spirit convicts us and as soon as things are brought to our attention, we have such a tendency to just push things down because it's not comfortable and not deal with things. And so my encouragement to you is that's such a dangerous place to be as we're going to look at more next week. But don't suppress that and don't, don't be crying out for repentance and then suppress it when you have that opportunity and you have, through the Holy Spirit, um, that godly grief over sin. Don't, don't, don't diminish that and try to push that away. Um, let that move you to changing your action as a result of, of that internal grief and brokenness over sin so next week we'll be wrapping up um, hopefully repentance and so um, we'll end with a word of prayer tonight I'll close this with a word of prayer